Hello, my name is Quentin Broussard. I am Assistant Professor of Clinical Sciences at California Health Sciences University, and today we will be discussing sodium disorders. And the reason why we're discussing sodium disorders today is that sodium, as well as water disorders essentially, are one of the most common types of electrolyte disorders, which include both hyponatremia and hypernatremia. Um, hyponatremia being sodium less than 135 milliequivalents per liter, and hypernatremia being sodium greater than 150 milliequivalents per liter. As a result of having hyponatremia or hypernatremia, you may have severe morbidity and mortality that may result from complications of sodium um, being too high or too low in the body. And as a result, as a pharmacist, it's important to be aware about these different sodium disorders and how to treat them. Because some of them are basically just treatment of the sodium or the water disorder that's underlying it. So our objectives today will be to define um, distribution and composition of basic intravenous fluids such as normal saline, lactated ringers, D5W, and some other fluids as well. We're going to calculate a patient's total body water, sodium deficit, water deficit, and potential change in serum sodium concentrations as applicable and determine etiologies and treatments of hyponatremia and hypernatremia. So our case today, um, GB is a 25-year-old male. He's 5'9 and 100 kilos, presenting to the emergency department with nausea and vomiting. His symptoms started last night after eating a sushi dinner with his friends at his favorite restaurant. His labs upon admission include sodium 125 milliequivalents per liter, potassium 3.5, chloride 90, bicarb 22, BUN 30, serum creatinine 1.3, and glucose 98. What type of sodium disorder does GB most likely have? Is it hypovolemic hypernatremia, hypovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, hypertonic hyponatremia, or isovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia? The next question is, other than correcting the underlying cause of GB sodium disorder, which of the following should be used to treat GB sodium disorder? Is it dextrose 5% in water, furosemide, fluid restriction, or normal saline? And the last question is, what is GB sodium deficit in milliequivalents? Is it 60, 600, 900, or does GB not have a sodium deficit? So after we discuss sodium disorders today, you should be able to answer each of these questions confidently. First off, we're going to start off with a little bit of background on sodium. In general, sodium is the most abundant intracellular cation. And as we've discussed before, particularly in the DKA HHS topic, normal serum concentration of sodium is 135 to 150 milliequivalents per liter. And this might vary depending on your individual institution. Some people may say 135 to 145. For the purposes of our class, we're going to use the bolded numbers here. And if you see a bolded number in throughout the PowerPoint, it's a number or a range that you will most likely need to know. Um, as well as if you see a bolded formula, it will be a formula that you need to know off the top of your head. Another thing that's important to know about is serum osmolality. And as we kind of talked about with DKA and HHS, typical serum osmolality clinically is between 270 and 300 milliosmoles per kilo um, of water. Um, though people may use narrower ranges such as 275 to 290. Just be aware 270 to 300 is what we're going to use in terms of osmolality. Why is osmolality so important? Well, osmolatic pressure and osmolality determine water distribution between the different body compartments. Um, and the different body compartments that we have are intravascular, interstitial, and intracellular. So essentially we break down our body compartments into intracellular and extracellular. 
So we have the intracellular um, body water, and we have extracellular body water, which is composed of intravascular and interstitial. So intravascular means within the vasculature or in the veins, um, which is essentially predominantly the thing that is determining your concentrations of sodium in the body. Your interstitial spaces are those spaces that are extracellular that are not within your veins or your vasculature, essentially. Um, it's important to note that because we have osmolarity and osmolality, um, water will flow from the compartment with lower osmolality to a compartment with higher osmolality. So think back to your basic science classes and think about osmosis. If you have something or if you have an area that has a higher concentration of, say, sodium or like a salt, what's going to happen is if you have another, you know, medium or um, division between two bodies where things can flow between, a hypotonic fluid such as water is going to flow to the area where you have the higher osmolality or the higher tonicity, essentially. So this is going to be important whenever we think about sodium disorders, because in sodium disorders, sodium disorders are not only a disorder of sodium, they're also essentially a disorder of water. So is the sodium actually your problem, or is it that you have too much water in a certain area or too little water? And sometimes that actually plays a bigger role than the sodium itself. And just a reminder regarding serum osmolality, that serum osmolality per what we talked about in DKA and HHS is two times the sodium concentration plus BUN over 2.8 plus glucose over 18. And this is the formula that you must know because this formula will be important in helping to diagnose the sodium disorders that we talk about today. So kind of going into that body water distribution piece, um, I gave you a sample of how body water actually distributes in the body, and particularly with hypotonic solutions such as D5W. So hypotonic solutions will flow to both the intracellular space and the extracellular space. Two-thirds of that, or 66 or 67 percent, will flow to the intracellular space versus a third of your um, D5W, which will go into the extracellular space. And as a result, when our, because we have two different extracellular spaces, the interstitial space and the plasma space, 25% um, total will flow into the interstitial space and 8% will flow into the plasma space. So essentially, whenever you administer D5W, to a patient which is a hypotonic solution that we're going to discuss in a moment, there's not a lot that actually gets into your in intravascular or plasma space. It's only 8% or 83 milliliters. However, whenever you have an isotonic fluid, such as um, normal saline or 0.9% sodium chloride or lactate ringers, all of it will actually flow into the extracellular space because of the tonicity that we discussed earlier. Um, so as a result, if you administer one liter of normal saline or 0.9% sodium chloride or even lactated ringers, 25% of that is going to go, or I'm sorry, um, now because we're adjusting for um, the fact that none of it's going into the intracellular space. Three quarters of that liter is going to go into the interstitial space for sodium chloride, lactate ringers, 0.9% normal saline. And one quarter or 250 mils of that liter of sodium chloride, 0.9%, is going to go into your intravascular space. And this is important to remember whenever we actually are treating the different sodium disorders as well as whenever we treat hypovolemic shock next semester, which hypovolemic shock is essentially low blood pressure due to a low volume of bodily fluids. So 
kind of going off of body water distribution and the breakdown of each of some of the main solutions that we have available to us. Um, like I said before, 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline and lactate ringers are both isotonic. And remember, if you're isotonic, you do not go into the cell. You will only go into the extracellular portions, which are the interstitial space and the intravascular or plasma. So 75% of that goes into the interstitial space, 250 goes into the plasma. So these are important numbers to know, as you see they are all bolded here, except for the numbers um, with 5% dextrose and 0.45% sodium chloride. So lactate and ringers and 0.9% um, sodium chloride do essentially the same thing. Now, 5% dextrose is different because it is completely hypotonic. So as a result, it actually will distribute exactly like this um, diagram here. So two-thirds of it goes intracellularly, and then the other third goes extracellular, with 75% of that remaining going into the interstitial space and 25% of that going into the intravascular space. And here, um, whenever you combine two hypotonic fluids, essentially, such as 5% dextrose and 0.45% sodium chloride, instead of getting a hypotonic solution, you get essentially an additive effect, and you get a hypertonic solution. So that's important to note. Um, I'm not requiring you to know how this fluid distributes in terms of um, intracellular and extracellular. I just want you to note that this is actually a hypertonic solution. So just be aware about that. Now here we get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of each of these solutions. So remember we talked about tonicity on the previous slide. Um, each of these different fluids have different components in them. So obviously 0.9% sodium chloride has sodium chloride in it, sodium and chloride in it. It doesn't have anything else in it. And the same thing can be said about 0.45% sodium chloride and 3% sodium chloride. 0.45% um, sodium chloride is a hypotonic solution and 3% sodium chloride because it's above 0.9, is considered a hypertonic solution. So use that 0.9 as your cutoff in terms of your sodium chloride. That will determine whether it's isotonic, hypertonic if it's above that 0.9, or hypotonic if it's below the 0.9. Um, it's important to know about the different concentrations of sodium that, um, and as well as chloride that are contained within each of the um, fluids here. So in terms of sodium chloride, 0.9%, there's 154 millicolons per liter of sodium and 154 millicolons per liter of chloride. Now, whenever you go to half that concentration of 0.45, there's 77 and 77. And as a result of there being 77 and 77, um, if you think about patients' normal sodium concentration in their body, it's between 135 and 150. So the more that you infuse of the 0.45 sodium chloride, potentially the lower your patient's sodium concentration will go. Um, so as a result, this may be a fluid here, 0.45% sodium chloride, that may be used in patients that have certain types of hypernatremia versus sodium chloride, where if your patient has a hyponatremia or a low sodium, you may use this fluid in certain hyponatremias or low sodiums to get your patient to be more closer to this concentration in the body. Um, now there are obviously problems with this in that if you infuse the whole body with 0.9% sodium chloride, you may actually get hypernatremia and hyperchloremia because these numbers are both above um, the normal ranges of 
what we typically see in the body of sodium and chloride. Um, lactate and ringers is more of a um, physiological fluid and it only contains 130 milliequivalents of sodium, 109 of chloride. Um, it also contains some potassium and some calcium, um, as well as lactate, obviously. Um, so this might be a better ideal fluid to use in some patients um, that have hyponatremia issues, particularly those who are hyperchloremic. Because with 0.9% sodium chloride, you have a higher level of chloride here. Um, like 0.5% sodium chloride, 5% dextrose and 5% half normal saline, um, each have low amounts of sodium compared to the human body. Remember, sodium is 135 to 150. Therefore, these might be used in hypo, I'm sorry, hypernatremia. And in patients who have severe symptomatic symptoms, of hyponatremia, such as seizures, coma, altered mental status, you may want to correct those patients even quicker with a more concentrated solution, such as 3% sodium chloride. This is very hypertonic in terms of its actual com composition. Um, it is 512 milliequivalents um, of, per liter of sodium. So now that we know a little bit about the basics of all the different fluids that are available to us, um, now we kind of need to have an idea about sodium imbalances in the body. So remember that whenever you see a sodium level on a BMP or basic metabolic panel, which basically has your sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarb, BUN, serum creatinine, and glucose, Remember, these are all concentrations. And remember from basic general chemistry that a concentration essentially is a solute over a solvent. A solute is what's dissolved. The solvent is what is dissolving the solute. And in this case, the solute and solvent are sodium and water. So sodium is being dissolved in water. Um, as a result, Whenever you have disproportionate amounts of sodium in your body um, or a change in your serum sodium concentration essentially. So remember a change in serum co sodium concentration is essentially governed by this sodium over water concept here. This may be a result of changes in water balance or total body sodium or both. So as a result you may have changes in body water and this may be changes where your normal increased or decreased, or essentially isovolemic, hypervolemic, or hypovolemic. And then you may have normal increased or decreased body sodium. So whenever you pair each of these things up, you actually have a lot of cross between these different things. So you may have normal body water, but increased body sodium, or you may have normal body water and decreased body sodium, or you may have decreased body water and normal body sodium. It's important to be aware of these different concepts because they will play a role in determining what actual sodium and or water disorder that you actually have. So as a result of all of these different pairings between how much body water and body sodium you have, many different sodium disorders exist. And they can be very, very complicated. As you see here on the right, um, there's essentially this illustration of a person that has lots of water in their body versus less water versus um, half as much water versus little water. And if you think about the way that sodium is in the body, say if you have a certain amount of sodium in your body, say if it equilibrates to about half of the length of this water here, whenever you adjust the water up, for example, you may actually develop a hyponatremia because your um, water is now being increased and your sodium level is still the same.
So in those cases, to correct your sodium disorder, you may have to get rid of the excess water. And we'll talk about that with some of those specific sodium disorders, particularly like hypo, hypervolemic hyponatremia. So let's start talking about hyponatremia specifically now. So hyponatremia, as we previously defined, is a serum sodium concentration of less than 135. And again, it can reflect increased, decreased, or normal body stores of sodium, as well as increased, decreased, or normal body water. Um, the way that we diagnose hyponatremia is first based off of a serum osmolality, which we previously defined earlier. And then we look at the patient's volume status after that, if necessary. Why is hyponatremia so concerning and how does it actually present? Well, the signs and symptoms of hyponatremia are often nonspecific. Most of them are related to changes in serum osmolality that may occur with hyponatremia, as well as fluid shifts in the central nervous system. And whenever I say central nervous system, I'm referring to the brain here. So whenever you have different fluid shifts, um, as well as serum osmolality changes, that actually affects your brain here. And as a result, you see a lot of CNS type symptoms like headache, lethargy, restlessness, weakness, disorientation. Remember that you may actually, you know, precipitate nausea and vomiting because you have different receptor zones in there, like the chemoreceptor zone that regulate nausea and vomiting. So you may also present with nausea and vomiting. Um, you may get muscle cramps, depressed reflexes. And if it's really severe, um, you may actually have seizures, a coma, or even mortality or death. So hyponatremia is not something necessarily to play around with, particularly if your sodium levels are lower um, than what you would hope for. So going into that morbidity and mortality piece with hyponatremia, it's important to treat hyponatremia because Serum sodium concentrations of less than 130 are associated with a 60-fold increase in mortality. Serum sodium concentrations of less than 120 are even significantly higher than 130. And unfortunately, I don't have a number to put on that, but if it's significantly higher than 60-fold, it's a lot worse, obviously. And then morbidity and mortality may relate to hyponatremia itself. It may relate to an underlying disease state that may be causing the hyponatremia or inappropriate treatment of hyponatremia. So, like I said earlier, there are many different types of sodium disorders and many different types of hyponatremia. And we're actually going to talk about five different types of hyponatremia. And it's important to realize what your um, osmolality status is as well as your fluid status so you can treat this appropriately. Because at the end of the day, we want to try to minimize morbidity and mortality if possible. And though it may not necessarily be due to the hyponatremia itself, it may be due to something else um, that is an underlying cause that needs to be treated so that your patient can prevent or minimize having these two things happen, morbidity and mortality. The first thing we're actually going to talk about before we get into our five different specific subtypes are severe symptomatic patients who have hyponatremia. And these patients have to have severe symptoms. So things such as altered mental status, seizures, or coma are considered severe symptoms. So essentially, altered mental status, so any kind of, you know, not being alert and oriented, um, seizures, so that can be visible or non-visible um, seizure activity, as well as a coma, are considered severe symptoms. So whenever you see a patient who has severe symptomatic hyponatremia, what you want to do is you want to make sure first that they're not on any hypotonic fluids. So those hypotonic fluids, again, are things like D5W, um, half normal in it, I'm sorry, half, um, half, um, half NS or 0.45% sodium chloride. Uh, 
um, 0.225% sodium chloride, etc. Because those fluids, because they are so dilute compared to our body's normal serum sodium concentrations of 135 to 150, are essentially diluting the body. So if you're on any of those, you need to stop it first. And then you also need to administer IV normal saline or hypertonic saline in those cases. Um, and hypertonic saline is considered um, anything about 0.9%, most commonly it's used as 3% sodium chloride. So if you administer 3% sodium chloride, um, you might want to pick a rate between 15 to 80 mils per hour, depending on what your actual ser serum sodium deficit is, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, so you want to ideally correct your sodium um, aggressively, but not too aggressively, because if you correct it too aggressively, you have, may have complications resulting from that. Uh, in patients who are non-hypovolemic, so basically patients who are euvolemic or hypervolemic, you can add a loop diuretic if the body stores of water are too high. So that can be anything such as ferrosamide or bumetanide or even torsamide in these patients. And again, you want to discontinue the underlying cause if possible. That is always the biggest thing that you can do. Because if you do any of this other stuff, yes, that's great and it will help a little bit. But until you fix the underlying cause, your patient will not be fixed. Now, here are some general recommendations about monitoring hyponatremia treatment. So we don't, like I said in the previous slide, we don't want to correct them too quickly. We ideally only want to correct them at a max of 12 milliequivalents per liter in 24 hours. And um, if you're going for 48 hours in correction, 18 milliequivalents total. Um, also, you want to watch out and do a maximum of 1 to 2 milliequivalents per liter per hour of sodium correction. So say if your patient goes from a level of 120 to 125 over the course of one hour, that's probably too quick. You need to correct it slower. You might need to decrease the rate um, of what you're actually doing. And you want to aim for a complete correction over about 48 to 96 hours, depending on how low your sodium is. 50% of your estimated sodium deficit in the body is usually administered over the first 24 hours of treatment, and the remainder over the remaining correction time. You don't want to correct um, to normal serum sodium concentration immediately, such as 135 milliequivalents per liter, unless it fits the above criteria. So say if it's like mild hyponatremia and you... Um, are correcting, you know, over the course of maybe like three hours where you get from 130 to 135, that's fine. But it's cases where you're severely low where it may actually be a problem. Because overcorrection can result in something called central pontine myelinolysis. Um, and this is also known as osmotic demyelination syndrome. Um, essentially, this is a CNS syndrome where because you overcorrected, now your body fluid and salt status is basically severely altered. And this can lead to um, suitable palsy, quadriparesis, seizures, as well as movement disorders. So you don't want to correct them too quickly. That's very important to note. Um, Whenever you're treating um, hyponatremia, you want to monitor the serum sodium concentration every two to four hours until the patient is asymptomatic. And then every four to eight hours until your serum sodium concentration is within normal range. People will want to be very, very careful about how they correct this. So whenever you're monitoring serum sodium concentration, you want to obviously follow these above rules and do it frequently so that you do not overcorrect too quickly and get this central pontine myelinolysis or osmotic demyelination syndrome.
So now you've gotten a lot of terminology about, you know, correcting sodium deficit. Um, you've talked about a lot of like body water, but how does this actually apply to the patient? So there's actually some formulas that apply to these concepts. So whenever you determine total body water for a male, it's traditionally um, 0.6 liters per kilotons weight in kilograms. And for a female, it's 0.5 liters per kilotons weight in kilograms. Now, why is it 0.6 for males and 0.5 for females? Well, think about males. Males tend to be a little bit more on the muscular side. And in terms of muscle composition, muscle contains a lot of water. That's why you see a slightly higher number with males than you do for females. And these are just population estimates. Um, but these are important population estimates to know about. And you see that they're bolded here, so you need to memorize them. So it's important to know about your total body water. Um, because that might be something that you have to take into account whenever you treat um, hyponatremia or hypernatremia. And we'll see that in the next formulas. Now, what is sodium deficit? So we talked about sodium deficit earlier. So sodium deficit in milliequivalents of sodium is your total body water, which is calculated by these formulas here, times 140 minus your measured serum sodium concentration in the body. So say if your patient, um, for example, was our patient from the case earlier, you would calculate his total body volume using the previous formula, plop that in here, and then pull his serum sodium concentration and multiply it out to get your sodium deficit, which remember is one of your questions at the end of your PowerPoint. Um, now, the next thing we need to discuss a little bit is if you're actually correcting hyponatremia with um, sodium chloride containing solutions. So if you're going to correct um, your hyponatremia with a sodium chloride containing solution, you have to use these change in sodium concentration formulas. Now, I know these don't make a lot of sense right now, probably since you don't have a patient in front of you but it'll just take some time as well as um, whenever we do our application exercises to actually understand what the purpose of these formulas are. So if you're correcting hyponatremia with one liter of 3% sodium chloride, your predicted change in sodium concentration in the body will be 512 minus your serum concentration over total body water plus one. You see that this formula is not bolded. You do not need to memorize this formula. If you need this formula on an exam or a CAD or something else, this formula will be, will be given to you. Um, if you're correcting hyponatremia with one liter of sodium chloride, 0.9%, its change in sodium, sodium concentration is 154 minus serum sodium concentration over total body water plus one. And make sure that you don't do the total body plot water plus one first. Make sure that you use your order of operations. So anything in the parentheses happens first, then you do your division, and then you do your addition after that. So make sure you follow the rules of order of operations or else you're not going to get the correct answer. Um, other hyponatremia types. So these are essentially the meat of what we typically see um, in with hyponatremia. So again, remember that we're going to diagnose hyponatremia via tonicity or osmolality first. So you see here that we have isotonic hyponatremias, hypertonic hyponatremias, and hypotonic hyponatremias. And within the hypotonic hyponatremia portion, we have hypovolemic, isovolemic, and hypervolemic. As you see here, which is actually pulled from the Kraft and Colleagues article um, from 2005 that is on Brightspace for you to look at, um, on the third or fourth page of the article, you actually see this classification and this diagnosis here. Now, you do not need to know every single cause of every single hyponatremia that exists here. If you need to know it for a case or a question, this will actually be provided to you on the exam for you to actually look at.
Now, I'm not going to tell you how to calculate like the theorem of osmolality, for example. You should know how to do that from your formula. Um, but you may be asked things such as, you know, if you have this serum osmolality and this volume status, what could be a potential cause of your um, hyponatremia? So as you see here, we have to determine the osmolality or the tonicity first. So remember, a, a normal serum osmolality is traditionally between 270 and 300 milliosmoles per kilo of water. Um, so that would fit in the isotonic region here. Low serum osmolality is anything less than 270, and some people would consider 275 or less to be lower. But for our purposes, consider it to be 270. And then elevated serum osmolality is greater than 300 milliosmoles per kilo. So essentially, if you end up in the isotonic range or the hypertonic range, you stop and you look to see what potential causes your patient has. Um, for this specific hyponatremia, and then you treat it based on that hyponatremia type, which we'll talk about. If you go and you have a hypotonic hyponatremia, so a um, uh, tonicity of less than 270, then you go on to, die, to look at your volume status. So you can be either hypovolemic, isovolemic, or hypervolemic. So that's very important to note. And this type of hyponatremia is actually your most common type that you probably will see in practice is hypotonic hyponatremia. And with that, remember you always assess the volume status. So let's talk about the ones that are not as common first. Um, isotonic hyponatremia results from an increase in the non-aqueous portion of the serum. And that can be seen in hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia, as these may take up more portion of their ser the serum. Um, as a result, the remaining part that's not taken up by the total serum um, results in that this is not actually a true hyponatremia. It's essentially what's called a pseudo-hyponatremia. The sodium concentration in your aqueous portion still remains normal, um, but you, if you want to treat this, which you don't necessarily have to, you may improve this by treating the underlying cause. So if you have hyperlipidemia, then you obviously will treat whatever the etiology of the hyperlipidemia is, whether it be high LDL, high triglycerides, whatever you need to treat regarding that. To show you what that graphically looks like here, this is a patient here who actually has a normal... Um, serum sodium level here. But whenever you increase that amount of protein or a lipid in hyperproteinemia or hyperlipidemia, you actually might, you know, decrease the total body or total concentration that you have of the sodium. And that's actually okay because it's still the same concentration here. It just might not be the same concentration within this whole plasma total here. So whenever you're taking, you know, sodium levels, for example, it's measuring this whole portion of plasma volume here. It's not measuring this plasma water concentration here. So keep that in mind. So don't freak out if you see a patient who has isotonic hyponatremia. Um, it's usually just due to elevated lipids or elevated proteins. The next type we'll talk about that's not as common um, as the hypotonic hyponatremia, but it's probably more common than the isotonic hyponatremia, is hypertonic hyponatremia. And this may result from hype. I'm sorry, I actually mistyped something. It should say hyperglycemia, and it will be corrected or hypertonic sodium-free solutions. So if you remember from DKA and HHS, hyperglycemia results in water shifts out of the cells into the extracellular space. So essentially you get a dilution, dilutional effect. And in order to actually assess your sodium level, you need to use your corrected sodium formula, um, which you can refer to in the DKA HHS PowerPoint to calculate the actual sodium level prior to correcting it. Um, now, again, this is bolded, so you need to know that formula. Um, so go pull your information from your DKA HHS PowerPoint. 
but essentially it is 1.6 um, times the difference of your glucose minus 100 plus your serum sodium concentration that actually reads out on the BMP. Like all other disorders of sodium, you always want to treat the underlying cause for if it's DKA or HHS. Um, in hyperglycemia, you want to give insulin, obviously. But you also may need to treat them with fluids as well. Um, and you want to ideally, if you have a patient who is requiring mannitol, which mannitol is traditionally given in cases where you have intracranial pressure increases in the brain um, because it's an osmotic diuretic. You want to stop these um, specific um, fluids. So that's essentially um, hyperglycemia and hypotonic sodium-free solutions here. Now we're actually going to get to the more common um, type of, or one of the more common types of essentially sodium disorders, which are our hypotonic disorders. So the first one we'll talk about is our hypovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia. These result from renal or non-renal losses, as you can see listed here. So essentially, your patient has to be hypotonic, so um, a osmolality less than 270, as well as hypovolemic. In order to treat this, think about your patient. So you ideally want to try to replace whatever loss of the volume they have, um, as well as replace the tonicity. So you can replace it with something that has volume as well as... Um, sodium. So 0.9% sodium chloride would be probably preferred here as it has um, a significant amount of sodium and volume associated with it. Um, or you may give lactate a ringer solution, though you may prefer the sodium chloride 0.9% first as your correction may be just slightly a bit quicker because lactate a ringer remember, only has 130 millicolons of sodium. The next type of hypotonic hyponatremia we'll talk about is isovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia. And the main type of isovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia that exists is SIADH. And this is essentially what is known as syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. So essentially, um, there is a lot of ADH secretion occurring here. So if you think of antidiuretic in the name, Essentially, it's preventing you from diuresing off water. Um, and as a result, water stays in the body um, such that there's no change in your volume necessarily that's major, but you have a dilutional effect from too much um, dilution, which essentially makes you hypotonic in this case. So... Um, this results in the urine being inappropriately concentrated. So in some of these patients that have these different sodium disorders, they may calculate or obtain um, different um, urine sodium labs. Now, I'm not going to have you necessarily know about like which um, urine sodium lab or urine osmolality labs that you need to obtain for each patient off the top of your head. We have an actual summary slide that summarizes this at the end, that's, that it's important to note. Um, so regardless though, you obviously want to treat the underlying cause if possible first. So if you see a lot of things here, a lot of the things that cause SIADH are medications. So in that case, if you want to treat the underlying cause, what you can do is essentially discontinue the medication and try to replace it with something else um, that may not necessarily be of the same mechanism, um, but um, may also treat your underlying disorder. So, for example, if you have, you know, um, depression as a result, um, and you're taking an SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, 
you might want to try another antidepressant that doesn't necessarily fit within these other classes. Um, and just because you have um, SIADH with one of these particular drugs doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have it with another. So that's important to note. So just because you have SIADH with SSRIs doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have it with tricyclic antidepressants. But you may. It just depends. So say, for example, um, also if you treat, if you have stroke as your cause of SADH. You want to treat the stroke first, but you also may need um, actual intervention with um, water restriction as well as oral sodium supplementation like sodium chloride tablets. Remember we don't need to correct the volume on these patients, but we need to keep it restricted to where it's at right now. You might also use a loop diuretic potentially to take off a little bit of that um, excess free water that is there. In addition, there's many other treatments for isovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, and these are not used very often. We ideally use the ones that are bolded here, plus or minus a loop diuretic. Um, so things such as oral urea crystals, which are seen almost never, um, demeclocycline, which inhibits the actions of ADH, um, you may also see phenytoin, um, lithium may be something that you see in practice potentially, and your Vaptian agents, which are Tolvaptian and Conovaptian. I'm going to focus mostly on the Vaptian agents, and the reason why I focus on these so much is because you actually do see these more in practice than the other set of, um, the other set of different hyponatremia drugs. Um, these are consisting of Tolvaptan or Samska and Conovaptan or Vaprosol. And like demeclocycline, they act against ADH. So essentially you're getting excretion of free water here, which can fix your underlying issue here because um, if you have impaired free water excretion, if you excrete that free water, it may actually be fixed. Um, other than obviously fixing your underlying source. Um, some important things to know, just some basics about these agents. I'm not going to go too far in depth into them, but you need to at least know the basics that are on this slide. Tolvaptin is an oral agent, it's PO. Conovaptin is IV. The bioavailability of Tolvaptin is about like 50 or 55% depending on which resource you look at. So if you don't have good um, absorption in your GI tract, you might consider the use of IV conovaptin, though most people will be able to tolerate tolvaptin and be able to absorb it enough to have an effect. It's indicated for only certain hypervolemic and euvolemic hyponatremias. Um, you, it should not be used in hypovolemic hyponatremias because if you're flushing out free water, it's going to make it worse, obviously. You're not fixing the underlying problem of the hypovolemic hyponatremia, which is you need to give them potentially volume of some kind. This, you're flushing out volume. Also, because you're essentially ex excreting free water through the kidneys, um, if you have a poor creatinine clearance of less than 10 or no urine output, these agents are contraindicated because they're predicted probably not to help much. You should avoid them in patients that have hepatic failure um, or hepatic impairment such as cirrhosis, which you previously talked about with Dr. F. Um, this agent must be initiated in a hospital setting um, because you may have extreme changes in your sodium occur right after administration of this agent. For example, I remember seeing one patient that we actually administered Tolvaptin to, only one dose of the, a small dose of 15 milligrams PO times one. And we actually saw that patient's sodium increase over the course of 12 hours from 128 to 140. And, you know, these, this agent is ideally given once a day in most cases. 
So, obviously, if you're already correcting 12, which is your max correction per day, you shouldn't correct any more. So, that's why it's important to monitor it in a hospital setting initially, though patients may be on it chronically. Um, Vactans, in general, have a debatable util utility in clinical practice. They can be used acutely and chronically. However, if you look at a lot of the data that exists out in the literature, they actually have no um, significant difference in mortality. So the difference in mortality at the end of the day is not statistically significant. And if you think about it and think about what we talked about with hyponatremia, um, hyponatremia is not necessarily the thing that is going to kill you. It's the underlying cause that may kill you. So, as a result, if you're just treating the hyponatremia, you're not really helping mortality. You have to treat the underlying cause first. That's the way I like to think about it. Um, another type of hyponatremia is hypervolemic, hypotonic hyponatremia. And this occurs in patients who are unable to eliminate body water properly, such as patients who have cirrhosis, again, as you previously talked about with Dr. F, renal failure, um, or heart failure, which we'll talk about next semester, I believe, with Dr. Snowden. So as a result of having too much volume, you need to essentially get rid of that volume or restrict that volume from actually being there. Um, so in these cases, you want to treat the underlying cause if possible. Though remember, some of these things may not be reversible, like cirrhosis or heart failure. Um, better treatment of them will actually help. You also want to do sodium restriction and fluid restriction on these patients. Ideally, you don't want to give them any necessarily extra sodium because they already have enough sodium in the body, most likely. But you want to restrict their fluid because if you restrict their fluid and your fluid comes down, um, then that concentration will correct itself. You might need to diurese them with a loop diuretic to get that volume off. So things such as furosemide. You may also consider a Vaptan here as well, though again, utility is debatable. And I probably would not do this first line. I would stick to the bolded treatment that you see here. So here, this is essentially a, um, a schematic of how they diagnose um, hyponatremia in general. Um, don't be concerned about these numbers here. I just included this slide for you to understand how they diagnose it with the urine osmolality and the urine sodium. Though remember, I'm not going to require you to memorize these numbers. So now we talked about hyponatremia. Now let's talk about hypernatremia real briefly. Hyponatremia is actually a lot simpler um, in concept compared to hyponatremia. Serum sodium concentration in hyper, hypernatremia is greater than 150, and it reflects, um, in general, a water deficit relative to total body, total body sodium levels. It's typically associated with serum hyper, hypertonicity, and will occur when the thirst mechanism is not function proper, functioning properly or access to free water is limited or restricted. So it's important to diagnose um, your specific hypernatremia disorder based on volume status. Because most of them are hypertonic in nature, you just have to look at the volume status once you have a patient that has a serum concentration of sodium of greater than 150. So unlike hyponatremia, you do not need to assess their tonicity status. Though you can use their tonicity status just to confirm it's hypernatremia. Again, with hypernatremia, you see a lot of nonspecific symptoms that are actually very similar to, or if not the same as hyponatremia. Um, and most of these, again, are related to changes in serum osmolality and fluid shifts in the CNS. You may see signs and symptoms such as headache, lethargy, restlessness, weakness, disorientation. This is um, muscle irritability or spasticity, which is different than hyponatremia hyperreflexia, which is different than hyponatremia, and again, seizures, coma, and death. So anytime that you affect sodium levels, you may see seizures, coma, or even related mortality. And again, if you have um, 
sodium concentrations that are well out of the normal range. So if you have a sodium concentration that's greater than 160, it's associated with greater than 75% mortality. And mortality associated with chronic hypernatremia is lower than with acute hypernatremia. Morbidity and mortality may relate to the hypernatremia, hypernatremia itself, the underlying disease state, or inappropriate treatment of hypernatremia. Okay, so again, whenever you're treating these patients, you might need to determine a change in your sodium concentration. Again, this probably won't make sense right now, but it will make more sense whenever we get to the actual patient cases. So if you see the formulas here, um, if you're correcting hypernatremia with dextrose 5%, you do zero minus your serum concentration of sodium currently over your um, quantity of total body water plus one. Know where your parentheses are because those parentheses need to be done first before you do this division sign. It's very, very important that you do that. Um, and um, so essentially you're doing zero here for D5W for 0.225% sodium chloride you're doing 38.5 minus your serum sodium concentration over total body water plus one here. Okay. And as you see with the one liter of 0.45% sodium chloride, that correlates to a change in serum sodium concentration of 77 minus the serum sodium concentration. Again, make sure you include your parentheses, unlike me who do not here. So that will also be corrected on the PowerPoint online. Make sure you always include your parentheses. So hypernatremia types, there's only three here. Hypovolemic, isovolemic, and hypervolemic. Remember, we're only assessing the volume status with hypernatremia. So essentially, the Kraft and Colleagues article gives the classification of these different hypernatremias and what the etiologies actually are. If you need these on an exam, you'll actually be provided with these. So don't freak out about trying to memorize the different etiologies. Because even in practice, you know, I use these different tables to help um, do differential diagnosis of what is actually going on. So hypovolemic hypernatremia. So this is associated with a loss of hypotonic fluids in the body. So essentially you lost a lot of free water in the body like D5W. Um, um, or um, free water in general. Um, and that will increase your sodium concentration. If your patient is hemodynamically stable, you'll want to calculate your water deficit like before. Um, and replace with a hypotonic fluid. Sorry for the technical glitch. Um, the water deficit um, in liters is equal to the total body water times the serum sodium concentration over 140 minus one. If hemodynamically unstable, however, you always need to replace with an isotonic fluid first. And we'll talk more about that in hypovolemic shock next semester. Um, because remember from your table before, if you have a patient um, who is getting an isotonic fluid, more of that will actually go into your intravascular space than D5 or half normal NS. And in patients that have hypovolemic shock where they're having hypotension because of low blood volume or low body volume. Um, in those cases, you need to get something in the patient that will actually um, correct that volume problem first. Don't worry about the hypernatremia initially. Give them some resuscitation fluids first. Then you can go back to this step once they're hemodynamically stable. Um, you may have patients with isovolemic hypernatremia, and this essentially is associated with a relative water deficit, i.e. free water or hypotonic sodium losses, or a relative sodium excess um, administration for hypo hypotonic losses, such as if you were to give isotonic sodium administration, such as normal saline to someone. This is commonly observed in diabetes insipidus.
and in diabetes insipidus, per your review article, um, this results in excretion of large volume of hypo hypotonic urine, i.e. about 3 to 15 liters daily, as well as polydipsia. And ideally, you should make the differentiation between central diabetes insipidus and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The central diabetes insipidus is due to a, release, a result of impaired synthesis or release of ADH, and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus results from a lack of kidney responsiveness to ADH. So essentially, you're doing two different you have two different mechanisms of producing a similar thing. Um, and you can give desmopressin, um, which is an ADH analog, to aid in the diagnosis of DI. So you don't necessarily need to know about what DI is. You just need to be familiar that DI is a cause of high isovolemic hypernatremia. And again, if you forget, this will be provided to you in that table on the exam. Um, again, you want to treat the underlying cause if possible, and because this is an isovolemic problem here, and you're essentially having lots of urine losses from the DI, you want to correct it with a, with a fluid that's going to correct your, your losses, which essentially are a result of your free water or hypotonic urine losses. So D5 would help balance that piece. DI is not very common, um, so just be aware about that in general in practice. Some other treatments that you can do um, include desmopressin, thiazide diuretics, indomethacin, or amiloride. Um, desmopressin or ADH analog, thiazide diuretics such as HCTZ, endomethacin is an NSAID, and it has to be specifically that NSAID particularly or a milleri, which is a potassium steering diuretic. Now we're going to move on to hypervolemic hyponatremia. I'm sorry, hypervolemic hypernatremia. Um, this is associated with administration of hypertonic saline solutions, sodium bicarb, or large amounts of normal saline. So essentially your problem here is you give them too much sodium and in a large volume. So you ideally want to decrease your under, or um, treat your underlying cause if possible. So decrease or discontinue any of the above solutions if you're on them. So say if you're on a hypertonic saline drip and you're starting to get hypernatremia from it, you might want to stop it. You ideally want to restrict your sodium um, as well as potentially give a loop diuretic, um, which can flush out the volume as well as some of the salt. You may also need to give them a hypotonic solution such as D5 or quarter normal or half normal normal saline to correct the hypervolemic hypernatremia. Remember, the biggest tenet of treatment of any medical disorder, particularly sodium disorders, is always treat the underlying cause of sodium disorders first if possible, but you may also need to resort to treating with the different fluid and water interventions that we talked about. And if the water and sodium interventions don't make a lot of sense to you right now, we're going to do an exercise in class that will help them make a little bit more sense um, whenever you can actually see it visually. So if you are not, you know, very well versed in like which, when do I use fluids, when do I use diuretics, when do I use hypotonic fluids, when do I use hypertonic fluids? We're going to help clear that piece up in our demonstration tomorrow. Here are our references. Um, we're going to go over the case questions real briefly. So we had GB, our 25-year-old male, who presents the ED with nausea and vomiting. Symptoms started last night after eating sushi. Um, his labs indicated that he had a low sodium level of 125. Um, a low chloride of 90, an elevated BUN of 30, and a serum of 1.3, which are essentially his pertinent labs here. What type of sodium disorder does GB most likely have? So if you remember back from the differential um, diagnosis schematic that Kraft and colleagues had in their article, if you actually looked at nausea and vomiting specifically, as well as the fact that they have a low sodium level here, 
And if you calculate their osmolality, you would actually find out that the answer here is hypovolemic, hypotonic, hyponatremia. And the reason why this is, is because if you're having nausea and vomiting, particularly the vomiting piece, you're losing body volume. So you're essentially at that point, you may be considered hypovolemic. Another way that you can tell this patient may be hypovolemic is the fact that their BUN serum creatinine ratio, which we didn't really discuss. But if you divide 30, th do 30 divided by 1.3, you get a number of around, I think, 23, if I'm correct. And if this number or ratio is above 20, that is um, an indication of essentially pre-renal dehydration, um, which could basically be explained by this vomiting situation that we have here. Um, another thing that we would potentially look at is their serum osmolality. So if you actually calculate it using the BMP, you get 266, which means it's hypo tonics because it's less than 270. Um, this first answer is not correct because it's not a hypernatremia. Um, though you'll, then you may see patients with nausea and vomiting present with hypovolemic hyper, hypernatremia. Um, this patient doesn't have hypernatremia, they have hyponatremia. So that's important to know. You can see nausea and vomiting with either of these presentations. Um, Hypertonic hyponatremia, this doesn't work because the osmolality is 266, it's not above 300. And isovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, this isn't the case here because this patient has nausea and vomiting. And if you go off of the schematic, we actually see vomiting is part of the hypovolemic piece, as well as again, the BUN serum creatinine ratio being above 20, which is another potential indicator that you may have volume loss in the body, essentially. Next question, other than correcting the underlying cause, which of the following should be used to treat GB sodium disorder? So ideally, if you wanna treat the underlying cause here, you would give them anti-emetics. Um, so things to prevent, prevent their nausea and vomiting. But in the meantime, the fluid that you should give them or the answer that you actually should give is normal saline. Um, because this patient is hypotonic and hypovolemic. So you need to increase their pa the patient's um, body volume in general. So furosemide, which is a loop diuretic, and fluid restriction would not expand their volume. So those two answers are out. You don't want to give them something that is hypotonic. Because if you give them a hypotonic solution that is less than the 135 to 150 milli equivalents per liter that we have in the body, then that will actually promote hyponatremia, not hypernatremia, which we want more hypernatremia here because we're already at a low sodium level of 125. And then the last question is, what is GB's sodium deficit in milli equivalents per, I'm sorry, milli equivalents? The answer here is 900. The way that you get that a sodium deficit is equal to total body water times 140 minus your serum sodium concentration. So if you do total body water of this patient, patient is 100 kilos. Um, if you do 0.6, because he's a male, times 100, you get 60 liters. Um, and that's your total body water, essentially. If you multiply that by 140 minus 125, you do six, you do 140 minus 125, which is 15, 15 times 60, which is 900 milliequivalents. So essentially you have to re replace um, 900 milliequivalents of sodium to get this patient's sodium back to normal. If you have any questions regarding sodium disorders, please feel free to contact me. I understand that this is a very complicated topic and we're gonna use a lot of application exercises as well as demonstrations to kind of help make this a little bit easier for you. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Thank you and have a good day.